So there's a lot of political things I can say that would be considered controversial. I think I can go out on a limb here and assume that we would all agree that Saddam Hussein was a terrible excuse for a human being. Not a lot of disagreement there. <clears throat> he was not a good person. He caused a lot of trouble for our nation and we went to war to defeat him, eventually bringing his regime down, bringing it to its knees. But his greatest atrocities were actually committed against his own people. He gassed them and uh, did other acts that are hard to imagine, impossible to justify. After America and its allies overran Iraq, Saddam went into hiding like a coward until one day uh, some of our soldiers opened a hole and found Saddam hiding in that hole. He was put in jail and then put to trial, found guilty, and eventually he was put to death. And I, I, I watched the very grainy, awful video of that, but Iraqis rejoice wildly, and even here in America, people rejoice to see the life of a man like that come to the end. I watched again last night, getting ready for this message, I watched a video from May 1st, 2001 in Philadelphia. A relatively uneventful game between the Phillies and the Mets. In the top of the ninth inning, it was one to one, and all of a sudden, Phillies and Mets fans, who don't generally care for one another very much, they begin to chant in unison, USA, USA, USA. These fans begin to chant, and the ball players on the field were looking around like, what on earth is going on? The batter at the time when this chant began happened to be a Canadian. <laughs> and he thought, are they trying to make fun of me? I mean, I, a lot of people didn't even know he was Canadian. He's like, are they trying to get my goat because I'm Canadian? Well, what had happened was people began to get messages on their phone. You probably know this, that at, earlier that evening, uh, Osama bin Laden had been killed in a raid on his compound. And suddenly a baseball rivalry meant a lot less than the end of the reign of terror of a murderer of thousands of people. Osama was dead and America rejoiced. <clears throat> it feels a little bit weird to rejoice when people die. And yet that's exactly what we do. A man is in hell. I think that's a safe... I, I think with Saddam and Osama, I don't think it's too much judgment to assume that Neither one of them died with faith in Jesus Christ. And we Christians rejoiced at that. Is it wrong to rejoice? There is something in us that rejoices when that kind of evil is destroyed. Even in our sinful state, we know that the world is broken. It's not like God made it. It's not like God intended it to be. Things in this world are not right. They're not like they're supposed to be. And when a great evil is taken out of the world, we can't help but feel like things are better. Hitler is gone and things are better. Saddam is gone. Gaddafi is gone. Bin Laden is gone. Belichick is gone. Oh, I'm sorry. That, I, I, I went the wrong way. I, 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 let me rewind that. I... Bin Laden is gone, and, and when they're gone, things are just better. And we feel like we should rejoice, like we should sing the hallelujah chorus. And I think, at least on a human level, it isn't wrong, because that's exactly what happens around the throne of God in Revelation chapter 19, when the judgment falls on the earth at the end of the tribulation period. Now, George Handel wrote perhaps the greatest song of all time. 
the Hallelujah Chorus from the Messiah is an unmatched song, so great that when, I think it was George II, heard it for the first time, he created a tradition. When you hear the Hallelujah Chorus, you're supposed to stand when it's played, when it's sung, because it's just a tradition. When you hear that song, it's so glorious that people stand when it begins to play. It's because the king was like so moved. Handel, when he first wrote the song, he was so moved at his own music, he said, I have touched the face of God. Well, most of the lyrics from that, it's not a complicated song lyrically, most of the lyrics come from Revelation 19 and Revelation 11 from our text today. It is a song of praise to God, as I said, largely taken from Revelation 19. When God's judgment is complete on the world, when the seals have been opened, the trumpets have been blown, the bowls have been poured out, and Babylon is completely brought to its knees, the response in heaven is glorious praise. Heaven sings hallelujah. Such praise that the words to that praise form the basis of the hallelujah chorus. You see, the world today is moving in a direction, and things aren't right. And so Jesus begins to make things right. And as he begins to turn the world around, it is awful, it is painful, but it is part of the process. Remember, the process of answering the prayer of Jesus on earth as it is in heaven. God is determined to make things on earth exactly like they were in heaven, where God is on the throne and Jesus is worshipped as Lord of all. And so when the, when the process is complete and earth's sin has been judged, two things happen right away. Believers in heaven break, all, all of heaven breaks out for a hallelujah chorus. And then after that, believers in heaven join together for a celebratory meal. Actually, the timing of that is uncertain. But there's a celebratory meal known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. And once that is over, the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And the world's direction changes forever and ever and ever. Jesus comes back and the prayer is answered. Things on earth become as they are in heaven and Jesus is Lord. So now we begin the study of the end. There are only four chapters left in the book of Revelation, although it will take us I'm actually now going to take a little more time to study the good parts of the book of Revelation, the glorious heavenly parts. I want to affirm two biblical facts as we get into this. First of all, no one knows when Jesus Christ is returning. We're not supposed to know. God has made it clear that we don't know. The reality of the return of Jesus will not be like any of our charts. You ever seen those intricate charts that show all the details of Christ's return? It's not going to be like our charts. And I have read some pretty interesting fiction stories. I don't know if you remember, if you're old enough to remember back at uh, a book called 666. I think it was Salem Kerbin wrote that. And then, of course, there was the Left Behind series that took the world by storm. And I'm not criticizing those books. I disagreed with a little bit of the stuff that was in them. I mean, any time two people, uh, even if they have the same view of, of eschatology, they're going to disagree. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, when it happens, it will be nothing like you saw in that book. It's just not going to happen like that. And it's certainly got, not going to be anything like we imagine. The, that's one of the problems. The prophecies of the Old Testament, we can look back now and say, oh, it's so clear, but it wasn't clear to the people that lived it because the, the, the prophecies, when they're fulfilled, are so different. But the endless speculations, the, prophet, the false prophets today, 
incessantly setting dates. Listen, if somebody tells you they know when Jesus is coming back, you know they are a false prophet or a false teacher. Because Jesus told us over and over again, no one knows the day or the hour except God in heaven. And let me give you a little quiz here. Pop quiz. This will wake you up for a minute. You can go back to your nap after this. If the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour and someone comes along and says, I know the day or the hour, who should you believe? Thank you. We have one right answer in the back. <laughs> Go back to your nap now, Leslie. It's fine. No one knows the day or the hour, but it doesn't change the fact that Jesus is coming back. It's going to happen. It's going to happen one day. In 2 Peter 3, the apostle said that scoffers would come who would deny the reality of the, the second coming of Christ because of its delay. Now, in that day, in 2 Peter's day, like 30 or 40 years had gone by. And he was saying, people are saying, it's, it's been 40 years. And people are already, after 40 years, starting to say, it's been a long time. 40 years, and they're saying, Man, Jesus isn't coming back. He's been gone 40 years. Now, we're coming up on the 2,000th anniversary of Jesus' return, of Jesus being taken up into heaven. Sometime it's around, we don't know the exact date of Jesus' death and his ascension into heaven. It was either probably 32 or 33 AD. So if we live long enough, in about nine years, we're go it's going to be 2,000 years since Jesus Christ went back up into heaven. And they were complaining after 40 years. But it says in verse 8 of that chapter, 2 Peter 3, with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord's watch ticks differently than mine. I get really frustrated when I'm in Africa. Bart told me an old African proverb. In the West, we have watches. In Africa, they have time. Sit and think about that one. We'll say, we'll say uh, we're going to go somewhere at 5 o'clock. And I'm like, you know, Al Yoon, it's 5. And we need to leave. He's like, yeah, we've got to get there soon. Because at five, we, for us, 5 o'clock means that's when you've got to be there and get started. You've got to be there a little early and get there. For them, it's like when you start thinking about going to get there. Their, their time works differently than ours. When we say we're going to be there at 10, it means maybe it'll start somewhere around 10.30. It's an approximation. You know, it's just, it, it operates. Well, God's clock operates completely differently than ours. Obviously, Jesus did not come back this last week. Maybe he'll come back today. Maybe not. Maybe not. When I was growing up, you know, it was the 60s and, and the early 70s. And there was this fervor that we were in the terminal generation. I think it was as we started to approach the year 2000, that was kind of hanging out there. And, and then in, in the 90s, then the, the uh, Left Behind series kind of caught us up in that all over. And we were just sure that we were part of the generation that was going to see the return of the Lord. My dad was absolutely certain he said, I'm waiting on the upper taker, not the undertaker. <laughs> he used to say that all the time. Well, my dad, at the age of 91, COVID and leukemia took him. And, and the, Lord, the Lord's going to take him one day, but he's going to be part of the dead in Christ who rise first. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if... <laughs> I, I still, you know, I still hope that one day I'll, I'll hear the trumpets instead of the ambulance. You know, I, I, I still have hope. But the fact of the matter is, the Lord's watch ticks differently than, I, than, than, than my watch. And it may be in my lifetime, maybe in my grandchildren's lifetime, it may be another 2,000 years. 
but the events of Revelation 19 through 22 will take place. And the Bible said scoffers will say it's been a long time. And generation after generation after generation of Christians have said, well, it's going to happen in my lifetime. And so you know what people do. They say, well, you keep saying that and it doesn't happen. Why don't you stop believing that? Keep believing. Keep hoping. Because one of these days, that generation is going to be right. And the clouds will roll back and the trumpets will sound and, and the faith will be sight. And you keep hoping because with the Lord, a thousand years is as a day and a day is as a thousand years. It's only been two days. It's not been a long time for God. He's got a lot more people to save. There's a lot more work to be done. So today what we're going to do is begin looking at these glorious chapters where the Lord comes back. What we're going to look at today is uh, the first of the two sections. Revelation 19 and 20 describes the end of the world. And then 21 and 22 is the beginning of the new heaven and the new earth which is literally uh, where heaven comes to earth. Now, I've always thought about us going off to heaven, but literally, if you take that scripture literally, the new Jerusalem descends and God's dwelling is with man. Now, whether that's meant to be taken literally or not, I tend to take it literally. Uh, but that's what it says. By the end of chapter 20, Satan, the beast, the false prophet, and all who have sided with him have been eternally judged. They're dealt with, cast into the lake of fire, and Jesus is established as King of kings and Lord of lords over all the earth. The promise is fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven, and history's purpose is fulfilled. So, Revelation 19 and 20 records the consummation of God's glory on this earth. And there are seven separate steps in that process. And we're going to look at those seven steps not today. Today we're going to get the first two. Next week I think we're going to get another two. And maybe the last three the week after that. We'll see. Uh, and maybe it'll take us a, a little longer than that. Because these are important things. Today I want us to look at these first two steps. And the first is the Hallelujah Chorus. It is an odd step to see heaven rejoicing at all the death and destruction. But we sing the Hallelujah Chorus at Christmas time. But as I said, the scriptures are based from this passage in Revelation primarily. Uh, it speaks about Christ's final victory here on earth. Revelation 19, 1 through 6 describes how the heavenly chorus sings about the victory of God over the hordes of evil on earth. There are four expressions of hallelujah. I, four times. First of all, a vast multitude, perhaps the same one from Revelation 7, 9, praises God's salvation, glory, power, his just and righteous judgment because he's avenged his people and brought judgment on Babylon the Great, which we talked about last week. Uh, God's power has rescued us from our enemies and defeated all of those who stand against him. They follow that up with a second hallelujah, praising God. Now this is strong, but the smoke of God's judgment against his tormentors rises up billowing gloriously, showing that God has judged these enemies. The 24 elders then join in with a simple conclusion to it all. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you know what amen means? Things are just like they should be. That's how it should be. And the 24 elders signifying the church and the redeemed of all time. Look at what God has done in, in destroying the wickedness. In bringing down all of the Saddams and, and Osamas and Hitlers and all of the wickedness of the world. And they just say, Amen. The world is finally as it should be. This wicked, sinful world 
has been brought down. Amen. Hallelujah. You know what hallelujah is? Hallelujah is the most common command in the Bible. Hallelujah. You little Hebrew. I know you love a Hebrew lesson. Nobody, everybody gets up on a Sunday morning and just says, you know what I really need is a Hebrew lesson. Hebrews, Hebrew is actually one of the most, one of the easiest languages to learn if you can learn from, to, to write from right to left without vowels. Uh, but it's a very regular, precise language. And uh, halal is praise. And halalu is a command you praise. You get, a, you get up, stand up and praise. Halal, halal, halalu. You better praise. Yah, we all know, is Yahweh. So hallelujah is a command to praise the Lord. It is, I'm pretty sure, and I haven't gone back and counted it, but I'm pretty sure it's the most common command in the Bible. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's what our lives are supposed to be all about, is just praising God. Praise the Lord. What are you, what are you here for? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Live your life to praise the Lord. Live your life in such a way that God receives praise from everything you do. Let your mouth be lived to praise God. Let your life be lived to praise God. Your life is meant to be a hallelujah to the glory and honor and praise of God. So hallelujah, that's what we're here for. Uh, and that's what the 24 elders join in and they just say, Amen. Things are now like they should be. Evil has been destroyed, so let's praise God. And finally, in verse 6, we get one of the ones that was really used for the hallelujah chorus. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. He shall reign forever and ever. Why don't we just stand, somebody stand up and hoist the hallelujah chorus real quick. Les, would you do that? Would you sing the hallelujah chorus for us real quick? Now he doesn't think he will. Okay. <laughs> for the Lord God the Almighty reigns, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, this offends our modern sensibilities a little bit because we don't understand the holiness of God. We're not really... We don't understand how holy and pure God is and how much our sin offends him. When his destruction falls on this world, when the world is demolished by God's wrath, it's not petulance, it's not cruelty... It's God acting to set the world right, to restore what should have been, to deal with the cancer of sin. Um, when I had cancer, and again, I, my cancer was caught so early, the doctor said, you know, we could let it go for a while. It won't make a difference, but still, he said, let's get it out of there. And I... I'm embarrassed to call myself a cancer survivor because I had like the mildest form and it was so easily treatable. A year later, the doctor said, if I didn't know I'd operated on you, I'd say that your kidney had never been operated on. I have like the, but, but I, I am a cancer survivor. And when they found the cancer in me, they said, let's get rid of it. Why? Because the cancer was going to destroy me eventually. It would have eventually done me dirty. And so they said, let's... <clears throat> they used this big thing they have up at Mercy in Sioux City, a, a robot. I said, I want to see the robot. And I got in there, and it scared me to death. I said, knock me out now. <laughs> that, what do they call that, Da Vinci robot or something? I saw that thing, and it so freaked me out. I said, I want to go. <laughs> Take me away. Calgon, take me away. I don't want to see that thing anymore. But, uh, but when they see the cancer, what do you do to a cancer? You destroy the cancer before the cancer destroys you. And again, I, I don't want to overdo this because they didn't even do, I didn't even have chemo or radiation or anything afterwards. That was how simple mine was. Uh, so I, I don't want to overblow this. I... But God acts to set the world right. And those who set themselves against God choose to be part of the cancer 
And so God, in restoring what should have been, in dealing with the cancer, he has to punish that sin. Our perspective is not like God's. See, we see this world as a fun place, a benign place, a neutral place, where bad things sometimes intrude, tragedies, pandemics, accidents, disasters, even evil people. Sometimes they break into our wonderful world and disrupt our wonderful lives. God sees this world differently. Our world stands in rebellion against him. It is still his world. It reflects his beauty, the beauty of his creation. And it's the joy. He loves this world. But sin sets this world against him on a path of destruction. It is a cancer that eats away at nature, at governments, at everything in this world. This world is broken, careening towards ruin because mankind has rebelled and refused to worship the creator. And that has consequence. God steps in to set things right. He created this world to be a place of beauty, of joy, of peace, even pleasure. <clears throat> These are all byproducts of obedience to God. Instead, humanity has chosen to ignore God and rush headlong in its own direction, which brings only pain and sorrow. And it never works. God's judgment is not just to show his wrath. It is the first step in restoring the world to the paradise that he intended. You see, God is creation's surgeon. His judgment removes sin. His judgment goes in to remove the destructive cancer eating away at this world. The, so that spiritual health can be restored. And when that happens, heaven rejoices. Yes, many people who decide that they are going to align themselves with evil, who refuse Jesus Christ, get caught in the destruction of that cancer. Sinful people love their sin. People love darkness rather than light. And they get caught in that, and it's a tragedy. That was not what God intended when he created this world. But, yet any, but, but still, heaven, when it sees the judgment falls, knows that the reign of Satan, the horror of Satan, the cancer of sin and death and Satan over this world is coming to an end. And it's about to be made glorious again. And heaven breaks out in the hallelujah chorus. And that's what Revelation 10, 1 through 6 is about. Then comes the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now our marriage traditions are so different from those of biblical days, we often fail to understand this. God's relationship to Israel and the church's relationship to Christ are both described in the Bible as marriages. Uh, an understanding of a Jewish wedding is kind of a key. <clears throat> Parents would reach a contract for their children's marriages and a dowry would be paid. This, now, I, I never liked this idea until I became a parent and I, then I wished that we would restore arranged marriages. <laughs> now that I'm a grandparent, I really wish we could restore that idea. And the potter familius would have right of first refusal. But the grandkids don't agree. But this process was called betrothal. The parents would form an agreement. Father of the groom, father of the bride. And the bride's parents would pay a dowry. The couple did not live together, but were legally considered husband and wife. That is why Joseph and Mary were considered married, even though they had not lived together, they had not come together. She was still a virgin. The bride was promised to him and to no other. She waited for the day, and it would surprise her. She did not know. And one day, the groom would just show up, and he would take the bride, and there would be a big celebration. And they would consummate their marriage, and there would be a big party, a big festival a feast at this point. Now we are the bride of Christ. Individually and corporately, we are betrothed to him. The contract has been signed and sealed. The Holy Spirit who dwells in us, that's our dowry. That's the seal. According to 
Ephesians 5, 27, his desire is to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. And today, by the Holy Spirit, the, Jesus Christ is working <clears throat> to make us ready for that day. And we wait for our bridegroom, like the ten virgins in the parable, seeking to be ready on the day he appeared. What's your job today? You're to be ready if the bridegroom appears. One day the bridegroom will come. Revelation 19 is a little light on chronology, and we'll argue that a different day, but heaven rejoices like exactly when the festival is at the beginning of the tribulation, middle end, I don't know, but uh, the bridegroom will come, and this wedding feast will take place sometime during the tribulation. And when the, when the bridegroom comes in glory to take us, one day, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, and 17 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. At some point, this feast will be on. We'll, we could be sitting here, and before I finish this sermon... It's nearly over, folks, I promise. But before I finish this sermon, the clouds could roll back, the trumpet could sound, and we could be on our way to the feast. The bridegroom could come for us. He could, he could come for us soon. Today, and it might be tomorrow, and, and it might not be for a hundred years or a thousand years or two thousand, because... With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. We are the redeemed of the Lord, the betrothed bride of Christ, and we await the glorious day when He comes for us, and our marriage is completed, and we'll be with Christ forever. And from that moment on, you want to know where we are during the tribulation and times that? Just look for Christ. We're with Him. When He rides out of heaven, well, we're with Him. We're riding behind him. Well, what are we doing? Well, I don't know. Whatever Christ is doing, we're there. Because we're the bride of Christ. We'll be transformed. You know, today it's hard. You ever tried to break a habit? You ever had a bad habit and you tried to? That's hard, isn't it? Do you know that on the day Jesus Christ returns... 1 Corinthians 15 says that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be transformed. I won't have any more bad habits to break. Because in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I'll be like Jesus Christ. It'll all be over. Just, just like that. Our faith will be made sight. The blessings of salvation will be ours. We'll be taken forever to his eternal home. Our world today may be tough. But our wedding feast awaits, and what a glorious day that will be. We are the bride of Christ, and our duty today is to live every day awaiting the moment that he'll come for us. To be faithful, chaste, devoted to him. You see, sin, it's not just, oh, that's bad, that's dirty, that's ugly. Yes, it's all that. But the problem with sin as a Christian is that we're being unfaithful to our, our groom, whom we're awaiting. We're being unfaithful. Uh, we're being an unfaithful bride. We must live every day with the, expectation, with the expectation that this could be the day. This could be the day that he would come. You know, it wasn't this week. And maybe it won't be today, I don't know. But it, I have to live today like it could be. Maybe today will be the day that the trumpets sound and, and we'll be summoned to the feast. So here's the question. Now I get nasty. <clears throat> there may be somebody here who's never trusted Christ. And I got to tell you, <clears throat> we're awaiting a feast. And I'm going to get mean with all those awaiting the feast in a second. But if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you got something much more difficult awaiting you. You need Jesus Christ. 
Don't leave here today without trusting your life to Jesus Christ. Don't, don't take that chance. But Christians, here's the question for you. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, if the trumpet had sounded this week and the feast had come, would you be embarrassed were you ready? What would the bridegroom have found when he came for the bride? There's forgiveness. There's renewal. But our job is to, is to stay ready every day. To be ready every moment of every day for the coming of the groom. Let's, let's be ready. And if he only comes for us when life ends, that's fine. This, this scripture just has been, it's, it's worked for nearly 2,000 years. It'll keep working for those who follow after us. But our duty is to stay ready for that day when we see the bridegroom face to face. Father in heaven, I pray that we would be ready to see you face to face. May our hearts be prepared, even now as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Prepare our hearts, Lord, that we might be ready for you. Ready for you. If you come today, hallelujah. And if, we, if you tarry another day, another week, another century, another millennium, may we be ready every day, seeking to please you and to be faithful to you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen.